As you recall in the previous training video, we learned what a theme is, and a theme is basically a collection of these three elements. So up here on the page layout tab in the themes group, you have your themes, but they're made up of theme colors, theme fonts, and theme effects. So these three elements make up the built-in themes that you see here. And you can change them individually, so after you select a theme from the theme drop-down arrow, you can say, well, if I don't like the color of that theme, I can customize it and choose another color here, or better yet, if you don't like any of these colors here, you can come down here at the bottom and create a new theme color. Click on it, opens up the theme color window, divided into two sections. The left one is the theme colors you can choose from, and the right side is the sample. What you want to do is you want to compare what you see over here to match it up over here to see what you're changing. For example, we've got the text dark and light, black and white. There's black and white text. The black goes against a lighter background, and the white text goes against a dark background. So looking at the backgrounds, you can see that the dark blue is for the white text in the front, and then you have the light background for the dark text that's in the front. So you have something that pops out, light text against a dark background, and dark text against the light background. Then you also have the different hyperlinks. You can go ahead and choose a hyperlink that somebody clicks on, then after they click on it, showing the color that it was something that they just clicked on, or a followed hyperlink. And you can choose the different accents, as you can see the different accents for the colors within the chart here, or for the objects that you insert into your document. So I could do something crazy if the theme that I choose has a light background, and I want to say, let's make it something else that's light, maybe light green. You can see it updates the sample here. And then let's say for the text, the dark text, instead of black, let's click on the drop down arrow and choose something, well, maybe a kind of a medium blue there. You can see it updates there. And then if I choose a theme that has a dark background, what kind of dark background do I want it to be? Uh, not dark blue, let's do like maybe dark green. I know, it doesn't look good, but you get the idea. And then instead of white text, oh, I think I'm really going to annoy you guys. Let's do uh, orange. And you can see it updates the objects there as well. So it's trying to complement with what you choose with the text and the objects. In any case, go ahead and make the changes here, and then choose a name for it. It's going to be Spiffy Colors, and then go ahead and click Save. And then if I want to choose it, come up here, click on the drop-down arrow, and it's right there. It's already being applied to my document. I didn't change all the colors, so the shape and the effects aren't being updated. And then we have the theme fonts. Click on the drop-down arrow. Those are customizable. Come down here, in other words, and create a new theme font and you can choose your heading and your body. So if you don't see what you like in the drop down arrow, then go ahead and choose a different uh, heading font if you want to, you know, something that works well for you, like Berlin. And then maybe for your body font, let's do Tahoma, and we'll just call this Kooky, and then click Save. And so it updates it because when I go ahead and save it, Microsoft assumes that since I created it, that I want to apply it automatically. If I just want to create it but not have it automatically applied, well, after I create it, then I have to come back up here and change it back to the way I had it before, which was, I think it was Arial for the heading and Times New Roman for the uh, body. Now for the effects, click on the drop down arrow and you scroll down to the bottom. You're not able to customize that or create your own. You can just go ahead and choose from any one of these, uh, these templates like Metro, click on that, select it, and depending upon the effects you added to your objects, your shapes, is how it's going to look. And since I don't have hardly any effects applied to this uh, object here, the circle, you're not going to see much of a change. And then to get rid of those, come back up here, click on the drop down arrow, go ahead and right click on it. You can edit it to update it or delete it to get rid of it and say yes, delete that. Click on the drop down arrow. I've got my cookie. I can go ahead and right click and delete that. Say yes. And for my themes, click on the drop down arrow. I created Spiffy in the previous training video. I'm going to go ahead and right click and delete it here. Say yes. And well, even though it's still applied here, as far as choices go in the future, it's not available there. I'll have to choose something else. Something that will annoy you at the end of this training video. I'll choose Austin. I need to insert a picture before I can show you how you can modify it. Let me go ahead and scroll down here. And I want to insert one right here where it talks about a dragon. Since I don't have a picture of a dragon, I'm going to go ahead and use Microsoft's clip art. As we learned in an earlier training video, to insert clip art, just come up here, click on the insert tab, go to the illustrations group. There it is, clip art. Go ahead and click on that. Opens up the clip art task pane and it remembers what I was previously searching for, which was Christmas. Let me go ahead and delete that because we want to search for now. I drag on, 
And before I go ahead and click go, I want to make sure that it includes the website or the content on office.com. And then as far as the uh, media file types go, let me go ahead and choose illustrations. It's already set to that because I don't believe there's an actual picture of a dragon. So illustrations will work. Let me go ahead and click off and click go. And let me choose my favorite one right here. Click on it to insert it. Give it a second. And then go ahead and close out of the task pane. And there we go. Now you can see that I've got a lot of white space above the dragon here and below. So if I want to go ahead and cut that out, or known as cropping, just go ahead and make sure the picture is selected because if it's not, you don't get the related contextual format tab. So select the picture. Now I know this is an illustration, but what I'm showing you here applies to both pictures and illustrations. So go ahead and select the picture or illustration on the format tab to the size group. There it is. Go ahead and click on the crop button. When you click on it, it adds these black handles here. All you have to do is go ahead and click on the one that you want to crop in and click and drag it down and it will bring the picture down, resize it so it's just above the head of the dragon. And I can go down at the bottom, click on that cropping handle, drag it in, and then go ahead and scroll up. So the gray parts is the original size of the image and it shows you that, what you're cutting out and what the new image will be, which is about yay big. So if I like what I have cropped out or cut out, then just come up here and click on the button again to finish it. So now I have my new image here, or the size of it. Now if I made a mistake and I'm like, whoops, I didn't mean to crop off the top here, then come back up here, click on the crop button, and go ahead and click on that middle handle in my case and drag it all the way back up to the top to fill in the gray so it's back to the original size. And then when I'm finished, just come up here and click on the crop button again to crop that out. Now if I made a mistake and I couldn't get it right back to the original size, then come over here on the Format tab to the Adjust group, and then you see that button right there, Reset Picture. Go ahead and click on its corresponding drop-down arrow and say that you want to reset picture and size. Click on it, and it goes back to the original size, okay? In which case, I'll click on Crop again. And go ahead and click and drag that in, and click and drag the bottom in, and that looks good. Click on the Crop button. Now you have other crop options by clicking on the corresponding drop-down arrow. Of course, you have the crop, which is the same as clicking on the button up here. So next is the crop to shape. You can go ahead and choose a shape that you want to crop it to, like a teardrop. So when you click on it, you can see it cuts off part of the dragon tail. So whatever part of the image doesn't fit within the shape gets cut. Now I can either go ahead and undo that, or of course click on the drop down arrow to reset the picture and the size. Click on reset picture, gets rid of that teardrop crop so I can see part of his tail now. Click on the crop drop down arrow again. You have aspect ratio whether you want it as a square, a portrait, or a landscape, and the ratios. You also have the fill and the fit, where it resizes the picture so that the entire picture displays inside the picture area. Go ahead and click on it, and it resizes it so the actual picture, the proportion of it, where it had more height, you can see that now it doesn't show the crop. It actually fits within what I had cropped. Okay, I'll go ahead and hit undo. Next, you can go ahead and resize the picture if it's a bit too big or you want to make it bigger. You can do it one of a couple of ways. You can either go ahead and use one of these handles here, resizing handles, by hovering over the right middle handle I can click and drag it to stretch it more horizontally or, you know, click and drag it in to shrink it up or more vertically by using the top middle handle. Or if I want to go ahead and do it proportionally where I'm not stretching it so it's more vertically or more horizontally, go ahead and hover over one of the corner handles and click and drag out or in, and you can see that it doesn't stretch it vertically or horizontally, but keeps it proportional. The other way to do it is numerically, if you don't want to click and drag, and do it manually by stretching those resize handles by coming up here to the size group and typing in either the width. You can see when you hover over it, you get the pop-up that says that's the width, and then this is the height. You can go ahead and type it in here, three, hit enter, or you can go ahead and click its expandable dialog box button on the size tab, he got the same height, 3 inches, there you go, 3 inches, and then width, 3.21, width, 3.21. And then you can see because I resized it, you can see that the height is 6% more than its original size, and the width is 20% less than its original size. So if I go ahead and click Reset, it restores it back to its original size. Click OK, and boom, there you go. Which, by the way, instead of going ahead and resizing it numerically here, you can expand the dialog box here, and if you resize it up here and say instead of 2.84, which is the height, and 4 is the width, if I say it's 3 and hit the tab key, notice how it readjusts the width so it can keep it proportional. It will do that within this window as long as this box is checked. Lock aspect ratio. If it's not checked and you uncheck it, 
what you do in one, like you can make it ridiculous, like 50, and hit the tab key. Okay, it's got to be between 0 and 22, so there is a limit. So if I type in 20, hit the tab key, it's not going to readjust and keep it proportional with the width. So it's going to be stretched, wow, really tall, vertically. In any case, let me go ahead and reset the picture, make sure that it's checked, locked aspect ratio. So what I do in one for the width, it adjusts it accordingly with the height or vice versa. Okay, let's go ahead and click OK. And then finally, when it comes to rotating the image, you can do it one of a couple of ways. You can either come up here on the Format tab to the Arrange Group and flip it. Click on the drop-down arrow to rotate it 90 degrees right, left, flip it vertically or horizontally so it's facing the other way to the left side of the document. Or you can see that green little handle up at the top. Hover over it. You can see that an arrow is coming around in on itself. When you click on it, you get a bunch of arrows, which means that it's now in movable mode or rotating mode. So if I go to the right, it tilts to the right, go to the left, and let me go ahead and put him on his two feet there and let go. And then click off in a blank area. Look, he's walking on his front two feet. Isn't that adorable? Let me go ahead and select it again. Now, when you go ahead and you rotate it by using the green handle, when I click on it, notice that when I go to the right, how smooth it is. But if I hold down the shift key, it does it in 15 degrees increments. So it snaps every 15 degrees. So I can go ahead and snap it right to pop goes right there. Let go of the mouse, then the tab key, and looks good to me. Now if you want to adjust the brightness or the contrast of your picture, the brightness where you can make it brighter, or the contrast, well, the contrasting between two colors, where it's more defined if you increase the contrast, just come up here on the Format tab to the Adjust group, click on the Corrections drop-down arrow. You can choose some of the defaults here, Sharpen and Soften, you know, hover over it, see if it makes a difference there. There's the brightness and contrast there where you can do, well, it looks like a plus 20% of brightness and a negative 20 on contrast, or go ahead and manually change it yourself. Click on Picture Correction Options, and over here, there you go. You can do your brightness by percentage, one points, two points, and so on, and contrast. You can also do the same here. And then when you're finished, you can close out, and it'll be applied. Or you can go ahead and click Reset so it sets it back to zero. Close out. How about the color? Click on the drop-down arrow. Um, we've got the color there. You can well choose other options for color for saturation, color tone, recolor, or something in a, a single color like blue accent color one light. Click on that. Pretty simple. And then they have some artistic effects. You can choose one of these. Let me click off. Then they have the top button here, which is the compressed picture. When you click on it, it allows you to reduce the size of the picture. So if your picture in a document is, let's say, 10 megabytes and the picture is 9 megabytes, well, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and reduce the size of the image. So if you need to email it to somebody, it doesn't take as long or take as much space on your computer. So you've got the compression options. And by default, they're checked, where you can go ahead and apply this correction to this picture only or uncheck it, and it'll apply to all the pictures throughout your entire document. And then this checked means that it will delete the cropped areas. As you recall, when we cropped the picture there, we had all this extra white space that if we made a mistake, we can go ahead and uncrop it. Well, this is a permanent solution where we can't uncrop it. And so it's why it reduces the size of the picture because it doesn't remember or keep track of the extra space around that image. And then down below here, you can go ahead and set the uh, pixels per inch. Of course, the smaller the size, the reduction of the image quality, but at least the person gets it quicker. And if you need to have it to be print quality, then you want to choose the top one here. But I can't choose it here because it's not an option. The best that I can do is uh, 150 pixels per inch. Or I can just go ahead and use the document resolution, which is fine for me. Go ahead and click OK. And then it'll take effect once you save your document and close out. So the next time you open it back up, the size of your document should be reduced because you applied the compression to this image or other images throughout your document. And then finally, let me go ahead and scroll up. I'm going to shrink the size of my picture here by hovering over the lower right resizing handle and clicking and dragging and pushing it in. And notice how the text is either at the top or the bottom. I can go ahead and use the text wrapping feature that has the text wrap around it, not just on the top or the bottom, but, you know, it would be nice to have the text to be on the right-hand side of it. So, with your picture selected, come up here on the Format tab to the Arrange group, and there we go, Wrap Text. So it'll wrap the text around the image. But how? Well, you can choose square. When you hover over it, it gives you a preview there. Do you like how the text is wrapping around it in a square format? Or you can choose tight and see if it gets it any closer. Or through, top and bottom again, or behind the text, or in front of the text. So that way it cuts out the text, which doesn't make sense to me. So my favorite ones 
are square and tight. Let me go ahead and just do tight. Click off in a blank area and looks pretty good. So that way I'm not wasting a bunch of white space right here. I can have the uh, text flow just around the picture. Of course, you can also right click the image and go to wrap text and choose it from there. You can also go down to more layout options. You got your wrapping styles. You have wrap text on both sides, left only, right only, largest only. You can also set how close it is to the image. Right now it's about, for the left hand side, 0.13. The right hand side is 0.13. You can reduce that or increase it so it pushes it out further. Let's go to one inch, click OK, and you see how it pushed it out. The screenshot capture feature allows you to capture images on your computer and insert them into your document. For example, come up here, click on the Insert tab, go to the Illustrations group, and there it is, Screenshot, click on it, and you get two choices. You can either insert, of all the windows that you have open on your computer, an entire snapshot of that window, and I have my website and my exercises folder, and you can see them down here. I have my website, click on it, brings that forward, that window, or I have my exercises folder. When I click on that corresponding button, it brings the window to the front. In my Windows 7 training video, for every window that you have open, you'll have a corresponding button down here on the taskbar. Well, I have a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. But when I come, let me go back to my document here, and I go to the illustrations group to insert a screenshot of the available windows, it only shows two. The reason why it doesn't show the others, well, first of all, this document here, it won't take a screenshot of itself, so that doesn't get included in the available windows. So we have a total of four that are available. Well, it doesn't include the first document that I have here or the image of some books. And the reason why is because those two windows are minimized. For example, I have them open, but they're not opened up or restored to fit the screen or a part of the screen. So if I come to my website here and I come up in the upper right hand corner, click on the restore down button and I come back up here in my document, click on screenshot. The only available window that I have now is well, the exercises folder, because that one, when I click on the corresponding button, is open and fills up part of the screen. Even though it's behind the document here, when I click on the document, it disappears behind it. It's still opened and filling up a part of the screen, but again, behind the document. Whereas these other windows right here, this one, that one, and the first one, the first Word document window, they're all sitting down here tight on the taskbar, minimized. But if I click on them to restore them, and then I go back to my document, it's now going to be available for a screenshot. Click on it, and now it's available, the website, okay? So simply go ahead and click on one of these windows to insert a snapshot of the entire window, and it dumps it right into my document here. You can see when I scroll down, the cursor was at the beginning of the title, so it inserted the image before the title. Let me go ahead and hit undo. If I don't want it before the title, but somewhere else in my document, just go ahead and put the cursor there before you do a screenshot. Let me come back up here, click on the Insert tab to the Illustrations group, click on the Screenshot drop-down arrow. The other choice is a screen clipping. So if I want a part of the window, not the entire window, then click on it, and it minimizes the document. And whatever the second window, the window immediately behind my document, when it got minimized down to the taskbar, that's the one that's going to be available. So if I wanted to be able to get a screen clipping of my Exercises folder, well, I can't get to it because that's behind this window right here my website. So to get out of this, hit the escape key, it brings the document back up, and then what I need to do is go ahead and click on the exercises folder to bring that to the front. So that's in front of the document, the document's in front of the website, it's the order here. So if I go back to my document, okay, the exercises folder disappears behind the document, but it's still in front of the website. So when I come back up here and click on the screenshot drop down arrow, do screen clipping, guess what is brought to the front now, or second line? It's the window here, Exercises folder, and behind that, or third in line, is my website. So you have to set up first what window you want to capture if you have a bunch of windows that are open, or part of the window that you want to capture, I mean. Let me go ahead and hit the Escape key, because I want to capture a part of my website. So to do that, I need to click on that button to bring the website to the front, then click on the document. So now the document's in front, but the website is second in line. The Exercises folder is third in line. So when I go ahead and click on the screenshot, go to screen clipping, it minimizes the second one that's in line is the one that I can go ahead and get a clipping of. So you get a black cross and the screen goes white. So what you do is you go ahead and in the upper left hand corner of some image that you want to go ahead and capture, click and drag to create a marquee around it or a box. Then once you've drawn a box around the image that you want to capture, or let me do just the box here, let go, 
it captures that image and inserts it right into your document wherever your cursor was at, which was below this paragraph here. A text box is just that, a box that contains text. What kind of text? Well, any text you want to put into it. I know that doesn't sound appeasing, but if you look at it another way, text boxes can be great attention grabbers. What I mean by that is that, for example, when you look at the title of my document, Faith, Hope, and Charity, it may not interest you, but if I take some key words in here, or key phrases like corrupt government, I copy that, put it in a text box, and put that box right here, and make the font of that copied text within the box large, like maybe size 16 or 18, that may grab your attention. Ooh, corrupt government. I wonder what this is about. Which government's corrupt? I don't know. Is it ours? You get the idea. So to go ahead and insert a text box, let me go ahead and click off. Come up here, click on the Insert tab, go to the Text group, click on the Text Box drop-down arrow, and you've got two ways to insert a text box. You can either choose from one of the Microsoft built-in text boxes or go ahead and draw your own. I'm going to come up here and choose this one right here. And notice that the uh, text box is centered in the middle of the page. So when I click on it, what does it do? It inserts the text box in the middle of the page. And the text in the document wraps around that text box. Pretty cool. You can go ahead and read what's within the text box. It gives you some suggestions. You can go ahead and type a quote from the document or the summary of an interesting point. That way, if the title doesn't grab you, hopefully there's something interesting that I could pull out of the document here and put into uh, the text box. And you can see the font of the text box is a lot larger than the text outside of it. So it's going to grab your eye. Then reading on, it says you can position this text box anywhere within the document. You can also use the Drawing Tools tab. There it is, Drawing Tools to format the uh, pull quote text in the box. What is a pull quote? We'll talk about that in the next training video, but basically it's just taking a quote within your document and pulling it over into the text box. Well, not pulling it, but making a copy of it in any case. So all I need to do is either copy and paste within the text box or just start typing. Hey, want a free lunch with Glenn Beck? Who wouldn't want that? In any case, let me go ahead and hit enter. I can change the font, so if I grab their attention with the title here, the next thing I need to do is maybe point them to a website so they can go ahead and enter the drawing by giving us their email address and their first and last name. So I can right click, go down to the mini formatting toolbar, change it from the current font to, uh, I don't know, maybe Times New Roman, and then right click again, and let's type in size 12, and then unselect the uh, italics button here, and then just start typing. And then of course I give them some website there, but you get the idea. So when I click off, you can see that when I'm looking at the document, hmm, Faith, Hope, and Charity, ooh, what's this uh, box down here? When a free lunch with Glenn Beck, sure, I may not read the document, but hey, I'll go to the website because I really like that Glenn guy. And then like it said, you can actually move the box around, just hover over the border. First, go ahead and select it. And then when you hover over the border, you get the four-way arrow. Go ahead and click and drag, and you can move that box. And then the text within the document just wraps around it. What kind of a wrap? Well, Come up here on the Format tab to the Arrange group, click on the Wrap Text, and you can see that down below the square is highlighted. So it's got a picture of some animal, I think it's a dog, and then the lines around it are the text, so you get an idea of how it wraps, if it does wrap, or if the image goes behind the text or in front of the text. In any case, I'm going to leave it at square because that looks good. Click off in a blank area. You can also draw a text box if you don't want to use one of the built-in templates. Let me go ahead and click off. Come up here, click on the Insert tab. Go to the text group, click on the text box drop down arrow, and click on draw a text box. When you click on it, your pointer turns into a black cross or your I beam to a black cross. Just go ahead and click and drag. When you do that, the text box is laid on top of the document here. Then go ahead and type in. Not only can you type in text, but you can actually insert images into the text box. So if I hit enter, come up here, click on the insert tab, and I can do clip art if I'd like. Go ahead and click on that and ooh, dragon. Let's go ahead and do a search for that and then find a dragon. Click on it. Wherever my cursor's at, that's where it's going to be inserted and it inserted it into my text box. Let me go ahead and close out of the task pane here and you can see that the image is a bit bigger than my text box and it expands just below it, in which case I can go ahead and click within the text box and take one of its resizing handles like the bottom middle handle, click and drag that so I can see more of the image of the dragon. And then, of course, I can hover over the border, click and drag, and move it around. Now, now, if I want the text to wrap around it like this text box, then after I have it selected, come up here to its Related Contextual Format tab, go to the Arrange group, and, well, click on Text Wrap. I like square or tight. Tight's really tight. 
closer to the uh, border of the image or the text box in this case. Go ahead and select it and then you can just click and drag and move it around and in any case if you want to get rid of one just click on it hit the delete key and there you go. Let me click and drag this one over. In fact you can drag it over or you can come up here on the home tab and you've got the paragraph alignments. You can do center, you can do right, and within the text box it's going to align the text and the image. I mean just all the formatting that you can do within your document you can also do within the text box. Okay. And then also let me come up here on the format tab. How about some shape style? Click on the corresponding drop down arrow and let's get a little color to our text box. Subtle effect red accent 2. Ooh, sounds like a fancy name. I better select it. After I do all this work for my text box, you know, I give it a color. Maybe I give it a shape outline, maybe something like blue, and maybe a shape effect, maybe some sort of glowing glow, warming glow. There we go. And I'd like to use that in future documents. Then go ahead and make sure it's selected. Come back up here, click on the insert tab, go to the text group. Now I know you're thinking that, hey, we're inserting a text box. No, just click on it like you're about to insert one. And instead of inserting or drawing one, we're going to save it. When you click on save, it says, okay, what's the name of it? It's going to be Spiffy. Now the gallery is where it's going to be found, and it's in the text box gallery. So when you click on that, it'll show up there unless you want to change it and add it to, I don't know, the footer or headers gallery. So when you click on headers or footers, it will be in there, but that doesn't make sense. But nonetheless, you get my point. So let me click off and leave it at text boxes. And then the category, you can have it as the built-in, but the built-in is what Microsoft has. I don't want it to show up as something that Microsoft created as a default, although I could have it in the built-in, or I can have it in the general, or I can create my own category. I'm going to put it in the general category, and then I can give it a description. You know, something that if you have a lot of similar text boxes, you can be a little bit more definitive by describing it here. And then where do you want to save it? I recommend saving it in the default building blocks. And we'll talk about building blocks in a later training video. And then you have where you can save it in the options. We'll talk about building blocks in a later training video. So to keep it simple, we've got the name, the gallery. It's going to be in the text box gallery. And then the category is going to be general with the description. Click okie dokie. And then, well, let's go ahead and see if it's available, not only in this document, but in any new document. Come up here, click on the File tab, go down to New. Double-click blank, opens up. Let's come up here, click on the Insert tab. Let's go to the Text group, click on the Text box drop-down arrow. Now remember, I didn't put mine in the category of built-in. Let me scroll down to the bottom. It's in the general. Hey, spiffy text box. And then when I hover over it, you can see the description. This is my fancy text box. Click on it, insert it, and cool. It kept the formatting of my text box, the uh, glow, also the colors, the image, and the text. So that way I don't have to go ahead and recreate this. Awesome. Let me go ahead and close out of here. I'm not going to save it. And then if I want to go ahead and modify the name of the uh, text box here or change it from the gallery of the text box, and you click on the drop down arrow, maybe put it in another gallery. In any case, any changes you want to make, or if you want to get rid of it, just come down here again in the general category, right click on it, and you get some options. You can go ahead and insert at current document position, edit the properties, organize and delete, or add gallery to the quick access toolbar, which you can add it up here. Now when it comes to editing the properties, click on it. It brings up the same uh, box here that I can go ahead and change the name, what gallery, category. In any case, let me click Cancel. Let's try that again. Click on the drop-down arrow. This time, we want to delete it. Right-click on it. Go to Organize and Delete. It opens it up. There it is, Spiffy Text Boxes, and it's the general category. I can come down here and click on the Delete button, or I can click on Edit Properties. brings up the same window. I go ahead and delete it. Say Yes. Click Close. It's no longer available in my text box drop down in the general category. I don't have a general category. A pull quote is taking a quote from your document and making a copy of it and pulling it over into a text box. We learned what text boxes are in the previous training video. You want to watch that. In any case, the purpose of the pull quote is to grab the reader's attention. So if they read the title of your document and they're like, hmm, I'm not sure, Instead of having them try to glance at the key points within the document, how about if you create a pull quote text box where you take a quote from the document that you think will really grab their attention and make the size of the font of the uh, pull quote a lot larger so they can quickly go over it, read it, and ascertain if it's something that they'll have an interest in. So to insert a pull quote, actually you're inserting a text box, just come up here, click on the insert tab, go to the text group, click on the text box drop down arrow. You can go ahead and scroll through the built-in, and there we go. 
a pull quote. It's an Austin pull quote. You can go ahead and select that or choose from any other pull quotes here or any other text boxes if you'd like. I'm going to go ahead and choose this one right here. Click on it, dumps it over to the right hand side. It says, look, go ahead and type in a quote from the document or summary of an interesting point that will grab the reader's attention that will cause them to hopefully read on or read the entire document. So all I have to do is go ahead and click here and just start typing or come up here, select part of a quote or some interesting point, and then go ahead and control C to copy, click here, control V as in Victor to paste it, and there we go. In fact, let me go ahead and click before here and do dot, dot, dot. That way when a reader glances at my document comes down, because their eyes are more drawn toward objects or images, they'll quickly look at this and see that it's short and it doesn't take much effort to read it and go, hmm. If our nation was based upon God-fearing people, then have we since turned away from him? Ooh, I don't know. Are we a God-fearing people, and have we turned away? I'm intrigued. I'm going to go ahead and read the rest of the document. So the pull quote has served its purpose. Now, as we learned in the previous training video, you can go ahead and format the text within the text box here. You can also move the pull quote box around just by hovering over the border until you see a four-way arrow. Click on it to select the entire box, then click and drag and, you know, move it wherever you'd like it. And, uh... For more fun and interesting things that you can do with this text box or pull quote text box, then again, you want to watch the previous training video. If you need to insert some shapes into your document, Microsoft has some defaults here that you can come up here, click on the Insert tab, go to the Illustrations group, and there it is, Shapes. Click on the drop-down arrow. We've got some ready-made ones here. Let's go ahead and choose a star. Click on that. And then to draw the star, after I click on it, you'll notice that my pointer or I-beam is turned into a black cross. That means that you're in drawing mode. To draw, just simply click and hold the left mouse button down and drag down and to the right diagonally. Now, if I go up and to the right, you can see that it's stretched more horizontally than vertically, or down and to the left, it's more vertical than horizontal. If I want to keep it at a perfect proportion when I'm moving my mouse around, hold down the shift key and it pops it out to the perfect proportion there of the star and then go ahead and let go of the left mouse button and let go of the shift key and cool, we got a nice star. Once we have it drawn, we get its related contextual format tab. So we can go ahead and look at some of the uh, shape styles. We can click on the more button and choose one of these, click on it and eh, looks pretty good. Or we can go ahead and customize it by coming up here, clicking on the shape fill, drop down arrow and choosing another color like red. And then we can have an outline to it. Click on the drop down arrow, choose a blue color. You can barely see the blue outline around it. If you want to really see it, then we can go ahead and change the weight of it, make it thicker, go down to weight, and let's do oh, thicker. Okay, that looks good. And then any shape effects, click on the uh, drop down arrow for shape effects. And we can do shadows, reflections. Ooh, I like reflections, those are fancy. Maybe something not so large, but maybe a little bit smaller. Click on that, and eh, it's kind of nice. Also, we can add text to our shapes. Just go ahead and right-click on the shape, go down to Add Text, click on it, places the cursor inside the shape here, and then we can just, you know, type in star. Now, when I start typing it, because it can't squeeze all the text within it, you may have to hover over the lower right-hand corner, the resizing handle, and then click and drag it to stretch it. And notice, even though I have the lower right-hand corner, for pictures and illustration, it stretches it proportionally, but if I go down and left, it stretches it more vertically, up and right, horizontally. If I hold down the shift key, it'll do it proportionally, then I can let go, and now I can see, oh, made a mistake, it's not start. Let me go back inside, hit the backspace key, it's my star. Click off, and then when you do that, of course, you uh, lose the format tab because we don't have the object or shape selected down below. Select it to bring it back up. I can come back up here, click on the insert tab, to the illustrations group and insert or draw more shapes or if I already have one shape selected I can click on the format tab and come over here to the insert shapes and choose another shape. In fact you'll notice that these shapes at least for the rectangles and the let me hover over that one ovals where are the circles and squares? Well if you go ahead and you click on a rectangle you can draw a square out of it by holding down the shift key. So I get my black cross go ahead and click and drag when I hold down the shift key it pops open to a perfect square and then let go of your mouse button, and there you go. To draw the perfect circle, you have to select the oval. Click on the oval up here, come down here, click and drag. If I go down uh, more vertically, there's the oval, more horizontally, but hold down the shift key, pops it open, perfect circle, let go of the left mouse button. Cool. Now I'm going to leave this for a second and open up the document that we used in the previous training video by coming down here and right-clicking on my Word document. Now the operating system I have is Windows 7 and it allows me to get my jump list here. If you don't have Windows 7 then you won't be able to do this, but in any case I'm going to open up 
my pull quotes document, click on that. When I open it up and I want to insert a shape, go to the illustrations group, click on shapes, and you know, go ahead and click on the rectangle, then click and drag, hold down the shift key to make the perfect square and let go. It lays it right on top of the text. And as we learned in earlier training videos, if you want the text to wrap around a shape, an object, or a text box, just go ahead and select it and either right click on it and go to wrap text. You can see the picture of the doggy or horsey there with lines around it. Lines represent the text and the doggy represents the object shape or picture. In any case, you can do something square, tight. You can actually have the text in front of it, behind it. If I do it tight, then there we go, it wraps around it, okay? Or you can just, after you select it, come up here on its related contextual format tab, go to the arrange group, click on the wrap, text drop down arrow, and you can choose it from there as well, okay? All right, I'm going to go ahead and close out of that, not save it. Back to where we are. Now, notice how one shape is overlaid on top of another. In fact, if I click on this shape and I hover over the border, you see the four-way arrows there? I can go ahead and click and drag that and move it. And notice how it's on top of the star and also the circle's on top of the star, but is the circle on top of the square? Let me go ahead and click and drag that. And you can see when I click off that the circle's on top of the square, the square's on top of the star. Well, what if I want the star to be below the circle, but just above the square. So we've got our layers here. We have this one's on top, next, and then start the last. So to change the layers, just go ahead and select the uh, shape, object, or image. Go ahead and right click on it, and then go up and you've got two options, either bring it to the front or send it to the back. We already have it at the back. We want to bring it to the front, but when you hover over it, it says, do you want to bring it to the front or bring forward? The difference is, is that when you bring it to the front, it brings it completely to the front and it puts it in front of all the other objects. But let me go ahead and hit undo. If I right click on it, then I go down instead to bring it forward, it brings it forward one layer. So now it's one layer ahead of the square, but one layer behind the circle. So if I go ahead and right click on it again and bring it forward one more, it's now brought forward another layer, which coincidentally is the top layer here. You can also, when you select it, if you don't want to right click, of course, come up here to its related contextual format tab to the arrange group. And there you've got your send backward, bring forward, which brings it forward one layer or sends it back one layer. Click on send back, click on send back, and we're back to where we started here. Finally, if I have an object like this big circle and I click and drag it in front of the square, and I don't want to move the circle because it's in the perfect position, but I do want to get a hold of that square that's behind it. How do I get to it? Because I have to click and drag it out of the way. Now I moved it out of its perfect position, and I can't remember what it is when I click and drag and move that. To click and drag it and go, uh, I think it's somewhere here. See what I'm saying? So let me go ahead and click and drag the square. Because it's at the second layer, it goes behind the circle. To get the square, let me click off. Now I can't see it. I can't select it. What you can do is you can go ahead and select one shape, and hitting the tab key, it will toggle through all the other shapes. So you can see it went to the star, hit the tab key, and it went to the square. It doesn't show me the square, it just shows me the outline of the square with the resizing handles. Then all I have to do is go ahead and, once I see the border, hover over it till I see my four-way arrow, click and drag it, and there we go. That way I didn't have to move the shape that was in front of it and get it out of its perfect alignment or position on my document. Now, in addition to the resizing handles that we learned in our picture training video, one last thing here is that you do have the rotating handle as well. Click and drag that to rotate it, tilt it one way or the other. In fact, you want to watch my training video on modifying pictures because what you see in there you can do to your shapes, illustrations, and other objects. Now that we know how to create basic shapes, as we learned in the previous training video, we're going to create some more basic shapes, but we're going to find and learn out some more advanced features when it comes to working with those basic shapes. For example, I want to create a target, a bullseye, something that we can shoot at. You know, you have a board, and then you have circles, each one smaller than the other as we go inside towards the center of the target. Well, to do that, come up here, click on the Insert tab, go to the Illustrations group, click on the Shapes drop-down arrow, and first of all, I want to create a board before I insert my uh, circles. There's the rectangle, there's the oval, and as you recall in the previous training video, if I want to draw a square, I have to select the rectangle. If I want to draw a circle, I have to select the oval, because when you select it and you move your pointer down, you can see it's in drawing mode, it's got the black cross, that when you click and drag, it'll draw a rectangle, but when you hold down the shift key, it pops it open into a perfect square. So let me go ahead and drag and let go, and cool, got my square. I'm going to go ahead and scroll down just a bit. Now, it gives me the default color for that square, which I don't like. I want to change that to a textured format, like that of wood, oak, or let's see what they've got. All you have to do is go ahead and right-click on the shape, 
go down to Format Shape, and then come up here and select that you want Picture or Texture Fill. And it'll give you some default texture. Click on the drop down arrow. You can see all the different textures. I'm going to go ahead and you've got, let's see, when you hover over that one, it says medium wood. And this one's oak. Uh, we can stay with oak, select it, close out, and there it is. Next, I want to go ahead and draw my circles or the targets as we go towards the center of the board. The circles get smaller and smaller, the targets. So come back up here on the Format tab to the Insert Shapes group. We don't have to go back to the Insert tab. It's right here as long as you have your shape selected and then go ahead and let's click on oval to create a perfect circle just go ahead and click and drag and hold down the shift key now I'm going to go ahead and start in the upper left hand corner click and drag down hold down the shift key to pop it open and I'm almost going to fill the entire square and let go and then do it again click on the oval hold down the shift key click and drag and do each circle one smaller than the next and do it one more time hold down the shift key and then Maybe one more time. Okay, shift, and there we go. Now, these circles aren't centered. I could go ahead and try to eyeball it and select this one and drag it to the center of that one, select that one, drag it to the center of that one, and so on. Better yet, Microsoft has a feature that will help you do that. It'll align all the objects that you select to center them and align them in the middle. To do that, just go ahead and we've got the first one selected. Hold down the shift key, select the next one, shift click the next one, shift click the next one, and in fact, shift click the board as well because we want each object to be aligned in the center of the one that's behind it of the one that's behind that and so on so after I selected all of them come up here on the format tab to the arrange group and then go ahead and hover over that it's called the align button click on the drop down arrow we want to align it to the center first so everything's centered here okay and then go back up click on the drop down arrow and then align it to the middle so it's aligned vertically and horizontally perfectly and then click off and Oh, that's fancy. Okay, let's go ahead and draw a star for fun in the center of it. Go ahead and click on Insert. Because I don't have an object selected, I'll have to go to the Insert tab to go to my Shapes here, or I can select one, and then come up to its Related Contextual tab, go to the Insert Shapes group here. That is on the Format tab, and there's my star. Click on it, and then come in the middle, starting in the upper left-hand corner, click and drag down, hold down the Shift key so it pops open, gives me a proportional uh, shape star, and not one that's more horizontal or vertical let go and okay so I can either go ahead and click and drag and try to get it to the middle and when I click and drag it's hard to uh, move it incrementally unless I use the arrow keys on the keyboard and if that's not incremental enough then hold down the control key and use the arrow keys and it moves it in smaller increments still I'm not getting it in the center of the circle so like we did before go ahead and select the shapes that you want to align to the center and to the middle there's the star hold down the shift key and select the uh, circle behind it and then come back up here on the Format tab to the Arrange group, click on the Align button. Let's align it to the middle. Okay, it moves it up just a little bit, so it's vertical, and then align to the center. And there we go. Click off and looks good. Okay, next you may want to color these in, so go ahead and select your shape. Come up here to the Format tab to the Shape Styles group, click on the Shape Fill. Let's choose yellow, that pops. And then let's go ahead and select a color for the center circle, we can make it red. In fact, what we can do is we can have the center circle, not the next one, but the one after that, also the same color as the center one. Hold down your shift key and then select that one. It allows you to select the circle between this inner one and that outer one. So we have the inner circle, then we have, let's see, one, two, three, the third circle selected, in which case I can click on the shape field drop down arrow and choose a color for that, make it red. Oh, that hurts. Or we can go to gradients, hover over that, come down and select more gradients opens up and we can go ahead and choose gradient fill you can choose from any preset colors so I can choose uh, early sunset looks good and then you can go ahead and mess with the uh, gradient stop so you can have when you click and drag this more purple or click and drag it as it moves from purple to you know a lighter shade of purple to a lighter shade of red you can choose how much color you want in there before it transitions to the next color you can also change the brightness, transparency. In any case, I'm going to go ahead and close out and see what it looks like. Ooh, a little bit trippy on my eyes here, but you get the point. Then I can go ahead and select this, the inner circle there, hold down the shift key, select the outer circle, do the same thing. In fact, I can right click on my selection, go down to format object, and let's choose gradient fill. There we go, brings it up again. So you can choose the different types, the direction. And right now it looks like it's linear diagonal, so you've got the brighter color in, the darker shade out. You can also reverse that and see if we can choose darker color inside and then 
when it goes towards the lighter color or the lighter shade here on the outside, select that, click close, and wow, this is getting really bad. You may want to stop the video. Doesn't look all that great, but in any case, let me go ahead and select the inner and the outer. Let's do a simple shape field, something light, and let's go ahead and hold down the shift key and select the uh, second inner circle and then the inner one. And let's go ahead and do shape field, something that's not going to hurt our eyes here. Something more pastel. Okay. Easier to look at. And then the star, shape fill, select green, and not too bad. Next, I want to insert some arrows that point to the uh, center of the bullseye, a couple of arrows. So to insert some more shapes, I can either go ahead and select one of them, and I get the related contextual tabs, or just come up here, click on the insert tab, go to the illustrations, click on shapes, drop down arrow, let's choose the arrow here, click on that, and then click and drag, and whoops, by default, the pointy part of the arrow points outward. If I want to go ahead and flip that, make sure it's selected. Then come up here on its related format tab to the shape styles group, click on the shapes outline, go down to arrows, and notice how it's pointing outwards. We want it pointed inwards, plus we get some other options. How about if we have it pointed inwards, but we use the arrow style number six? Ooh, pretty fancy. Let's go ahead and select that. That looks good. And the thickness of the arrow is pretty wimpy. So let me go ahead and click on shape outline again. Go down to weight, and let's give it something meatier. Ooh, four and a half point looks nice. And then if I hover over the resizing handle at the left, I can click and drag it and pull it and stretch it and point it to the center there. And then I can hover over the right side and click and drag that and move it in. Okay. And then the color, of course, you can change that. Come up here in the shape styles. Let's see what they got for styles. That includes a shadow and some color. Or let me click off. I can go ahead and choose the shape outline, choose a different color, maybe red. That pops a little bit too harsh, doesn't it? How about something more pastel, orange. Okay, we'll select that one. Now once I've got my arrow, and let's say that I want to go ahead and create another one just like that, but coming from another angle and maybe not hitting it right on the target here, what I can do instead of redrawing all this and recreating it, I can hold down the control key and hit the D for duplicate. That's the shortcut key that allows me to duplicate whatever I had selected. In which case I can just go ahead and grab the tail end of it, swing it down, grab the front of it and draw it back and say, well, we didn't really make the target here. The first time we did, maybe the second time we didn't. And then I can click and drag on the uh, arrow itself and move it in without resizing it. That looks good. And then if I want to go ahead and create what are called callouts, if you ever read the newspaper where they draw cartoons and they have little thought bubbles above their head or little uh, circles that are drawn to the mouth, those are called callouts. To go ahead and create one, let's go ahead and come up here, click on the More button for Insert Shapes, and go down to Callouts there. You can see we've got an oval callout, a thought callout. They call it a cloud callout, but it has you know a bunch of little bubbles going up. Let's go ahead and do an oval callout. Click on it. My pointer turns into a black cross. Click and drag diagonally down and to the right, and then let go. My cursor's flashing in the middle of it. I can go ahead and type some text and say Team A. They're on target. And then I can hover over the border of it till I see a four-way arrow. Click and drag that to move the shape around. And then if I want the tip of the callout to be right next to right on top of that arrow, just go ahead and hover over that yellow diamond. Click and drag it and stretch it and move it over. There we go. Click and drag that down a bit and then click and drag that up so the tip hits it right there. Looks good. And then, of course, like I said, if I want to go ahead and create that without having to go through all the steps again, because I have it selected, hold down the Control key, hit the letter D, duplicates it, and then I can hover over the border, click and drag that down, because this is going to be Team B, and then click in it, and then just go ahead and type over it, B, and in fact, I can drag that down a bit more, and then grab the uh, yellow diamond and drag that up. And, and then finally, with these callouts, when I go ahead and select one, I can change the, uh, the color of it, the feel, the outline, the effects. You can also right-click on it and go down to Format Shape. You can change it in the pop-up window here get a little bit more detailed. I'm going to go ahead and choose picture or texture feel. If I want to insert a picture or clip art, go ahead and I'll select files. So I have to look on my computer to find a picture, double click and find one. Ooh, tulips. Double click and close out. And All right. In any case, you get the point. When I'm finished with my uh, collage here of all these different shapes, and I want to go ahead and move this to, let's say, another document, well, you can select one shape and hold down the control key and copy it and paste it. No, that's not going to work because you have to copy, well, several shapes. What I want to do is I want to group all the shapes together. To do that, you can go ahead and click off and 
do control A and it selects all the shapes, but if you have other objects within your document, that's not a wise choice. So you go ahead and select the first shape, hold down the shift key, and consecutively click all the other shapes. And you've got quite a few to choose from the arrows, the callouts. And once I have them all selected, then I can either go ahead and right click on the selection and go down to group, which is probably a lot easier because it's right there without me having to come up here, click on the format tab, and then come over here to the range group and then click on the group drop down arrow to group it. Right clicking is better. It groups all the shapes together, that way it moves it as one. So I can click and drag it to move it down, to move it up. Also, I can right click on the shape, go to copy, and then go file to new, double click blank document. And then go ahead and paste it. Click on the paste button on the home tab. See? It copied all the shapes because it saw it as one group. Now, if I need to make changes to, let's say, some of the colors within the group here, I need to break it up because if I do any formatting now, it applies to the entire group. So to go ahead and break this up, right click, go down to group, and ungroup. And you can see all the different selections of all the different shapes. Go ahead and click off, then select one, and then come up there, click on the format tab, and you know, make any changes you would like. Whatever brings out the inner artist in you. Microsoft has the word art feature that's fancy text or decorative text. If you want to see what it looks like or insert some, come up here, click on the insert tab, go to the text group. There it is, word art. Click on the drop down arrow. You really don't have a choice than what you see there, but you can go ahead and change the format of it after you select something that closely resembles your taste or that you think will blend well with your document. I'm going to go ahead and choose this one. Of course, they all have names in case if you want to tell somebody else to choose the same one. That way you don't have to say, um, it's the red-orange thingy. Just go ahead and hover over it, and it tells you the name. This is Gradient Fill Orange. Whoops, gives me only a few seconds. Accent 6, Inner Shadow. Click on it. It inserts the word art where it says your text. If you click off of it, it'll keep your text here. Let me go ahead and click inside of it and change that to... And then when I'm done, click outside of it. I can go ahead and click inside of it and then click and drag the borders so I can have it more centered into the document here. And then you can make some changes here. They have on the format tab the Word Art Styles group where you can have quick styles to quickly change it to something else. You can also change, let me click off, hover over it. This is for the text fill. Click on the drop down arrow. Do you want to fill the text with a different color here instead of the gradient default? Let me click off. Or do you want to go ahead and change the outline of the text to another color here? Let me click off. Or you can go ahead and click on the drop down arrow for other fancy effects like a shadow. Ooh. You can also do glow, transform. It's kind of freaky here, some of these. In any case, you can see how it arches up. I mean, you've got a lot of choices there. Or you can come over here to the shape styles and make some changes here with a simple color and outline or some other effects. I mean, they're pretty much here, but this is more applicable to the word art styles. And of course, you have the expandable dialog box button that opens up gives you a bit more choice in your formatting for the uh, word art style text box. Let me go ahead and close out. Click on the more button, choose one of these that actually applies the color, fills it in for the text box, gives it an outline. Let me click on that to select it. Hmm. I think I fell backwards into this one. It looks kind of cool to me. And if you like what you see, go ahead and click off of it, removes the tab, and looks good. Now, if you ever read a fairy tale story, where it says once upon a time, and it has the big O for once upon a time, well, that's called a drop cap. It takes the first letter within the first paragraph of a document here in this case, or the story of a fairy tale, and it drops it several lines down, makes it larger. So if I go ahead and I say, okay, I want to start the story off with, I want to introduce you to a leading American. If I change that to a drop cap, it'll take the I, make it a larger font size, and drop it down one, two, three, as many lines as I'd like. So it's a cap that's being dropped, a couple of lines. So to go ahead and do that, just go ahead and click within your paragraph here. Come up here, click on the Insert tab, go to the Text group, and there's the Drop cap. Click on the drop down arrow. You can see when I hover over Dropped, down in the document, it automatically does that. and It drops it, so it's on the first line. It's a total of three lines that the uh, Drop cap is taking up. You can also have it within the margin, so it violates the rules and has the Drop cap in the margin and it lets the text line up just outside of that margin. Or you can go ahead and choose from some other drop cap options. Go ahead and click on that. Well, none is one option. You can have it dropped. By default, it wants to drop it three lines, and it did it one, two, three here. You can do four, five, six. Let's do four. And then how much distance do you want it from the text? I mean, 
let's go ahead and exaggerate to make a point. Do one inch, click OK, and there you go. It dropped one, two, three, four lines, and it's about an inch away from it. That's horrifying. I don't like that. Let's go ahead and hit undo and click on the drop cap. You get the idea how you can go ahead and customize that. I'm going to keep it simple and just choose the dropped option and click off and looks nice. Up until this point, we learned how to insert pictures, charts. Well, let's come up here, click on the insert tab, and there they are in the illustrations group. We covered all these except for the smart art, and when I hover over it, you can read more about it right there. It says the smart art graphics range from graphical wisdom process diagrams to more complex graphics. Well, I better show you. Let me click on it. It opens up and it gives you the categories over to the left hand side, including the all. That includes all the categories here. But let me go ahead and uh, cover some of these categories, like the list category. In an earlier training video, when you had a bunch of items that you want to put in a bulleted list or a numbered list, well, now you can go ahead and put it in a graphic list. For example, come over here, hover over one of them, and you can see the name for that smart art for that list. It's vertical box list. Click on it, and you can read more about it over here. And basically what it is is that for each item in your list, you can have it separated into each of these shapes. So instead of numbers or bullets, go ahead and do it graphically. Item 1 in the first box, item 2 in the second box, and so on. Let me come over here to the process and go over another one. Select the first one. That's the basic process. You can read about it here. And it says this is used to show a progression or sequential steps in a task process or workflow. For example, you got to eat your dinner first. After you do that, you can go ahead and have dessert. After you do that, you can go outside and play. Simple enough, right? Well, let me come over here and select hierarchy. I'm going to choose in our exercise here the organization chart. Come over here. You can read about it. This is used to show a hierarchical information or reporting relationships in an organization, like I'm the president, and then I have my assistants and subordinates. So let me go ahead and click okie dokie, and it inserts it. Now this is a bit big for me because it's cutting off the uh, text paint here, and I want to show you that. So I want to reduce the size of my chart here. And if you want to reduce it or make it even larger, just go ahead and hover over one of the corners until you see arrows pointing in opposite directions. Then go ahead and click. Let me try it again. Click. And then you can move it down or you can move it out. I'm going to go ahead and move it down just to right there. Okay. It's still cut off, but when it comes to smart art, you can't just go ahead and click on the border and move it around because it's based upon your paragraphs. As you recall, when you click on the Home tab, go to the Paragraph group, click on your Show Hide Codes, you get these paragraph markers and the way to get them, hitting the Enter, 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 Enter key. Okay. So if I want to go ahead and move this around, i got to have other paragraphs to move this uh, organization chart to. Go ahead and select it, hover over the border, click and drag. And when I move my pointer down, you can see that when I go from one paragraph to the next, you get that vertical dotted line. Wherever I let go, that's where it's going to take the smart art graphic to, or the org chart. Let go, and boom, it puts it right there. Okay, Four paragraphs down, one, two, three, and it's on the fourth one. I'm going to go ahead and hit undo and turn off the codes. You get the idea, right? Well, I can also align the uh, organization chart. I can't do it now because I have it selected. And you can see that it doesn't show me how it's aligned. So when I click on the outside of it into the actual paragraph itself and not working on the uh, organization chart, then it shows me that it's defaulted to the left. I'm going to go ahead and center that. Looks good. Click in it. And OK, now I can see my text pane there. Now the purpose of the text pane is that you can go ahead and either type in the text for your shape in the text pane or you can actually do it within the shape itself. So for example, I'm going to go ahead and type me as the president, Kurt. Oh, I can't fit anymore. Wrong. Just go ahead and keep typing. And when I keep typing, it reduces the font size to fit the longest text within any of these shapes to fit within that shape. So if I had some text in here, supercalifragilisticexpialatrocious, that's long text, so the font size in all these shapes would be reduced collectively to about, I don't know, size 1 or 2. If I want to go ahead and add my title below my name here, just hit enter within the shape and it's... Now, like I said, I can either type the text within the shape or I can come over here in the text pane. And when it comes to the organization chart, well, you have your president and then you have your subordinates and they're drawn down here. But when you have something like this, a shape off to the side and not directly beneath uh, one of the shapes, it means it's an assistant. So I have an assistant here. So I can come over here and type in Susan Dole. Now, if I want to go ahead and, you know, have the title underneath here, Susan Dole, Admin Assistant, I can't hit the Enter key because if I hit the Enter key while I'm working in the text pane, it thinks that I want to add another assistant. I don't want to do that, which, by the way, congratulations, now you know how to add 
but there's a better way to add shapes instead of doing it within the uh, text pane here. So I can either go ahead and delete that uh, line there within the text pane or just come over here, click on the border of the shape. Now when I click on the border, if the cursor is flashing in it, it's not going to delete the shape because it thinks that you're trying to delete the text within the shape. So click on it again to make sure that the shape is selected, then hit the delete key and there you go, it removes it. What you have to do instead is come over here and click at the end of the name if you're working within the text pane, hold down the shift key and hit enter. When you do that, it does a soft return, not a hard return, and it doesn't add an additional shape. It just gives you a new line below the name here, Susan Dole. So I can say admin. And then I can go ahead and use the arrow down key on the keyboard to go to the next bullet below. And then shift enter, he's a VP. And then arrow down, shift enter, he's also a VP. They're all VPs. Then the arrow down key, shift enter, VP. Now notice that because Michael Flanagan has such a long name here, where there's a lot more text within the shape than any other, it looks like it's shrinking, or it is actually reducing the font size of all the other text to the shape that contains the most uh, characters within the shape or text there. So the only way around that is to either abbreviate his name or go ahead and just hover over, let me click off, outside, and then click on it again so I can actually get the border of the organization chart. Hover over the uh, lower right-hand corner or one of the corners, then just click and drag to increase the size of it. That's the other option. Okay, let's go up here. Click on the Related Design tab because I want to go over the Create Graphics group. Got a lot of important features here like adding shapes. Like I said, there's an easier way than doing it over here in the text pane. All you have to do is come over here and select a shape that you want to add a shape to. And what I mean by that is that when you click on the drop-down arrow, you can add a shape after or before. That means linearly, meaning that you can add a shape on the left-hand side before the shape or after it on the right-hand side at the same level. Or you can add a shape above it, so I've got somebody above me. Or I can add a shape below me, a subordinate, which would be down at this level because this shape right here, you can see, is an assistant. Or it's just off to the side of the line and not directly below it and stretching out here or branching out. It's sitting on the side. So if I go ahead and I say, let's add another assistant, boom, it pops it over to the side and go ahead and type in a name. Let me go ahead and delete that. And let's do Michael Flanagan. Let's say that he has, click on the add shape, um, somebody in front of him. So we'll say before. So it adds a shape before. And because it's trying to squeeze these shapes within this amount of uh, room that it has here, then it shrinks all the shapes and the text here. So again, you may want to increase the size by hovering over one of the corners and clicking and dragging out. And then go ahead and type in the text, either within the shape or over here in the uh, text pane. Shift Enter will make her a VP as well. Now, let's say that we made a mistake and we're like, oops, I didn't mean to make Carol Brady a VP. How do I change that? Well, with the shape selected, you can come up here into the Create Graphic group and demote her. And it takes her down to the next level. So we have the first level, me, then we have the VP level, and then we have, well, she's no longer VP. She's at the next level, I guess, a manager. And you can also promote her and say, well, actually, we made a mistake. Let's promote you and put you back with all the other VPs. Okay, other things we have here, well, the text pane, when you click on it, it disappears. Click on it again, it brings it back up, or you can close out and then bring it back up. We have right to left, so if you go ahead and you click that, it will switch along this access point, whatever's on this side, over to the other side, and whatever's on that side, over to this side. So we have Matt Bain, click on it, he flips completely on the other side, Matt Bain. Susan Dole was on that side, she flipped over. So we can click on it again to reverse it. And then next, we have move up or down. When it talks about moving up or down, it means that the shape you have selected is not moving up or down because that would be a promotion or a demotion within the chart. It means to move it either to the left or right. And for me, when I have more than one person at the same level, I organize it in my mind at least that on the left-hand side is the person who's been with us the longest. So if Carol Brady was here longer than any of these other VPs, she has seniority, I go ahead and select her shape and then move her up. One. Moves her, okay, move her again. Now she's at the head of the line here from left to right. And then Matt Bain is next in seniority, and then Josh, and then Mikael. Okay, let me go ahead and select Josh here and select his uh, shape because I want to go ahead and demote him. So I can show you when I select Matt Bain. Now notice how that he's demoted, but hanging on the right-hand side. If I want to change that so he's hanging on the left-hand side, then come up here, click on the layout drop-down arrow. And then you can see left hanging, select that and he flips. So he's hanging on the left. You can go ahead and change that back if you want to the right. In any case, select whoever is above him and then choose the layout that you want him to hang from. 
but right now he's just hanging, so we'll leave him alone. Okay, next you have the layouts. You can go ahead and click on the More button and change the layout. I'm not going to do that because I like mine. And then over here we have the Smart Art Styles. Let me click on the More button. Ooh, shiny. Click on the Inset. That's the name of that shiny 3D uh, format. Click on that. I can change the colors. Click on the drop down arrow and I don't know. Let's choose what's that colorful or what's this one? That one's colorful range accent color 2 uh, to 3. Sure. Go ahead and select that. Now you have the reset graphic. I'll show you that in just a second. If I click reset now, it takes it back to the way it was, but let me go to the format tab and show you a few other things. You can go ahead and change the shapes, do shape styles, change the color of any shape that you have selected down below. So you can get more particular with the shape here, like Matt Bain, VP. Oh, he's really fancy. We better give him a fancy color. You can also do like we learned in our um, inserting shapes. You can change the shape field, the outline, the effects. Um, you can also add word art styles text effects, well, a lot of the stuff we've already covered. Finally, if I want to go ahead and take one of these shapes and say, well, I want to move it over here, you can. In fact, you can get really gross with this and go, oh, I don't know what that's doing. It's still connected to it, but now he's moved above here. Maybe he's a, an assistant for a day, and then we can go ahead and move him back, but when we try to move him back, it doesn't quite fit, does it? Well, you can either freehand it, or the other option is to go back to the design tab and click on the reset graphic. The good news is, is that it puts it back to the way it was. The bad news is, is that it put it back to the way it was, and I don't have my shinies here, and I'm like, oh, great, what colors did I choose? What type of style did I have? So you'll have to decide if that's worth it to you or not. Thanks for watching. Hey, as a quick reminder, if you like my video, please give it a thumbs up. You can also click on me and subscribe to my channel to get notified of the latest videos. And for great specials on my products, please see the description below this video.